So uh, I'm Steve, you can, and I give a very informal talk, so you can interrupt me anytime, and then we'll just drop slides off at the end, because nothing I say is really all that important that we can't cut it off at the end. Um, I'm going to talk about dropping science on your developer ecosystem, lessons from ecosystem management. My qualifications for this is that little known fact, I was a member of the Beastie Boys, and I did drop science like Galileo dropped the orange. <laughs> Okay. Uh, actually, really, my qualifications are I have a master's in forestry and a PhD in ecology. Nice. So I've spent a lot of time studying biology and eco not physics, hence with the black light. Now I can see it. But it's like developer husbandry. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> can you get that on right? That was not me. Okay. Okay. Just check in. Okay. So. We in the technical world like to talk about ecosystems all the time. I did a quick search on Google Images. Here's one for Drupal. That's kind of an interesting ecosystem, but there's a lot of players in it. Sometimes we actually even use the word ecosystem. This is the connected consumer ecosystem, right? There's, I don't know how this is an ecosystem with a straight line going back and forth, but somehow we have taken the word ecosystem to basically mean anything where things are connected in the technical world. And what I would like to do is take the metaphor of ecosystem or the model, we're gonna do science. Right? We're talking science here. You need some so, reverb. What? You need reverb. For that. Science! <laughs> I'm, right, Dr. Science, because he's got a master's degree in science. Um, Are you going to blind us with science? No. Uh, that just comes, well, maybe. The point is, uh, the point of what I'm trying to bring here is though, the science uh, ecosystem, go back to your high school. This is high school bio, remember, <clears throat> ecosystem students. And this was what you probably learned, probably on a map. And we can all tell this is a Mac, given the font and the 8 bits. And, but ecosystems were basically the idea that everything in the natural environment and certain natural environments were connected. Right? And there was different relationships and cycles. So the deer would eat the plants, and the, the deer would then die, and then a vulture would eat it, and then the rain would come and wash that away as well. Right? There's all these connectednesses. Connected. That's definitely not a word. There's all these connections. That was science as well. The connectedness, that's a te technical term. There's all these connections among the ecosystems and that leads to certain implications. And so I thought if we use that metaphor, right, we could use it like ecologists do. It came out of this idea that in conservation biology, the ecologists use this model. Ecosystems is a model, right? It's not the real world, it's a model. And ecologists use it because they found that single species management almost always left to emergency room conservation biology. And so what I mean by emergency room conservation biology is Oh my gosh, this species is about to go extinct. We need to pour billions and billions of dollars into this one species, and then we've only fixed that one species. And the poster child for that is the bald eagle. It worked for the bald eagle, and it worked in that case, but in lots of other cases, it doesn't work. Like we lost the dusky seaside sparrow. By the time we got to the point where we had actually done enough, <clears throat> the species was gone. And so they said, okay, which animal is going to force this issue? Bears. <laughs> a little Stephen Colbert in there for you, right? The demons. The, and the area where they forced it is, who recognizes it? You probably recognize this, Matt, right? Do you see, you know what this is? Anybody know where this is, other than Matt? It's the tundra of... No. No. Obviously Jersey. not a room of geographers. Jersey, exactly. Jersey. No. Oh. This is Yellowstone. Are you, you, I was thinking polar bear for some reason. Well, because I put a polar bear in the last slide. Pr I, I primed you. And this, the interesting part of the remote sensing here, to fail. I primed you to fail. The interesting part of the remote sensing, that's the boundary of the park. This is one of the few political boundaries you can actually see in the natural world. Does anybody know the other one? Another one? Haiti. Haiti. The border between Haiti and... Oh, Haiti, yes, that's one. And then also the border between Egypt and Israel where they put a fence up and prevented Bedouin from grazing. But a little trivia for your next cocktail party. The point is that this is the ecosystem. It's big, right? There's the actual miles of the park. This is something like 50 miles here. Right, so it's a big park. It's probably one. It, it is our biggest park, our biggest national park, other than I think maybe Denali, but I don't know. But the thing is, it's embedded in a larger ecosystem. <clears throat> this is the, the red dotted line is actually the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and there's bears there, grizzlies that they needed to manage for, right? And that was what drove it because bears and wolves. Oh wait, wrong slide. Wolves. <laughs> wolves actually um, have very large home ranges. You can't manage, like, the, the bald eagle, while it flies a lot of areas, it has very localized resources. Bears and wolves actually take over large areas, and they need large amounts of room to roam. And this is, the, this is wolf territories in Algonquin Park up in Canada. I, that's a shout-out to all. 
did he, did the Canadian leave? We had like one Canadian, another Canadian. Shout out to the Canadians. Your national park is in there. But this is what the ecosystem looks like for Denali, which is very similar in certain ways to Yellowstone. So you've got bears, and they basically feed on tons of things, right? So they're linked into a bunch of stuff, and everything that they're linked into is somehow linked into other things as well, along with the wolves, right? So the point with ecosystems is there's connections going both ways, and there's lots of connections. It's not a vertical line, right? And there's usually some sort of direct connections and some relationship between the things in the ecosystem. So some of the ideas that I'm going to focus on today come out of ecosystem management, which is when people try to deal with this. I'm going to, there's a whole list, so when you get the slides, you can look at these if you want. The ones I'm going to focus on are ecosystems are multidimensional. This comes from ecosystem management. Always collect and synthesize primary data. Right, so they started dealing with natural resource managers who were like, well, I'm going to suppress fire and I'm going to put out dead carcasses. And that should help. Right, but they weren't actually collecting data on it. And then engage in monitoring. So to do, mon to do an ecosystem, you have to engage in long-term monitoring. Because you have to be ready when things happen. And I'll show you why in a minute. They, there was an idea that came out of this called adaptive management. So the idea with adaptive management is rather than just throwing the bear out and throwing dead carcasses out there, you would throw some dead carcasses out that might be deer, some that might be goat, some you might not throw out at all, and you would do an experiment when you did your management activities so that you could actually make inference and then adapt what you were doing rather than just saying, well, it seems to work, it doesn't seem to work, I'm going to keep doing it, I'm not going to keep doing it. You actually want to use science, that's as close as I get to reverb, to help drive your management activities. And then the last thing was values are more important than facts and logic, which is not science. So I'm going to talk about values and goals for one slide. And this is the part you, as an ecosystem manager, if you're running a developer ecosystem or some other type of ecosystem, need to get done all by yourself. And this is where you read management books, and you read political science, and you read sociology books and psychology books, because you get values and goals from social, economic, and political. Right? And economic, I don't even think my economist professor would always say, Econom economy does, economics doesn't teach you what's right or wrong it teaches you what's most efficient. In our society, we tend to think that most efficient somehow equals right, which is not necessarily always true, right? But I think you need to get this part and look at this. It is the most important part. If you talk to almost everybody in this room, what usually fails on a project is not the technology, it is the politics that happened around the technology and the implementation of the technology. So don't, you ignore this at your peril, that's all I'm saying. And it's not science or usually quantitative, but it drives everything. That's all I can say, I can't really, there, it, the, the only other thing that came out of this in ecosystem management was involve everybody early on and get them to be stakeholders. But we can get that. Our, I think most people know that from good pop. They actually drew that from stuff that we work on. So, so now let's just go back to science, because that's the science, because that's the fun part for me. So one of the examples I'm going to use is I had to put the cute cuddly up there. But notice no LOL stuff around it. I resisted the urge. It is just a straight up sea otter. And the reason I'm going to talk about sea otters is because they're one of the key drivers in this ecosystem, which is like the Pacific coastal ecosystem, California, Alaska. And the problem is when you take sea otters out of the ecosystem, these guys do really well, which is good for the Japanese sushi market, right? Because these guys are expensive and they like to eat the gonads of these guys. But it's not so good for these guys back here, which is the kelp, right? So well, this is sea otters drive down urchin numbers, and by doing that, they allow the kelp to flourish. Basically, if you, don't, if you have too many sea urchins around, kelp gets destroyed, because they'll eat it all, and then the whole ecosystem collapses. Right? And so the idea with this is called keystone species. Because of the sea otter, they can drive these predators, of the, or the herbivores that feed on the kelp, out of the system. If you take them out, this is a system without sea otters in it, which we had for a very long time. And you'll notice the only thing you end up left with are sea urchins, starfish, and like mussels, and plankton. Right? So they're a keystone species because their interactions drive almost the entire ecosystem. And so the analogy I'd like to think, what are your keystone species in your ecosystems? Right? Think about keystones, like who's setting up the structure? Wolves do this as well. By keeping populations of caribou and elk down, they allow vegetation to flourish, and, then a whole, and beavers to flourish, and a whole bunch of other things come in. You're not going to do the Steve Ballmer developers dance now, are you? No. That, that was kind of... Developers. Developers. No, because I don't know that necessarily uh, the keystones in your system are always developers, depending on what... And I didn't want to get too specific, right? 
I didn't want to say, well, you should always worry about your developers, or you should always work about worry about your enterprise partners, or it depends on what you're back to the values part, right? You have to go back to the values part and say, where am I trying to drive my ecosystem? What's the goal for my ecosystem? Because our ecosystem is totally human developed, right? It's human derived. There is no even arbitrary scientific way that you can say, oh, well, this is the right goal for my ecosystem. You can't point back and say, well, historically speaking, this ecosystem consisted of, right? You can't do that with yours. Yours is totally driven by what your business goals are. So in a company, it's the guy with the cash. Could be. Right, budget. Could be, that could be one of the drivers, but it also could be, let's say you were trying to, let's say you were writing a PaaS, platform as a service, I don't know, some company might be doing that, like, I don't know, OpenShift at Red Hat, and developers actually could be one of the keystone species, because if I don't get developers on my ecosystem, the ecosystem falls apart, right? Because then there is nobody testing the product, there is nobody doing the feedback, there is nobody talking about it. It might be alpha developers, right? Like you might identify in that web before the alpha developers. So I'm like, oh, I gotta get Matt Rabel. I'm gonna reach out to him directly because he's an alpha developer and people trust his opinion. I need to get more alpha developers into my ecosystem. Not the low level developers, but the alphas. Right, but you just want us to talk about it so other people sign up that's the goal. So the overall goal, right? So the overall goal is that I want the system to be successful. I, but I could say for my e developer ecosystem, I want high numbers. And who's a keystone for getting high numbers? Alpha developers. I've decided that alpha developers are keystones in my ecosystem. And so I'm going to push to make sure that they're healthy in my ecosystem. Otherwise, the whole ecosystem will collapse. Yeah. So how do you identify the users, like social network analysis techniques? Or? Yeah, that, that's a whole other talk yeah. about who to develop, how to figure out who your alpha developers are, or who alpha developers are in general. But I'll leave that up to you. Whatever metric you want to use, and I don't want to focus just on alpha developers, the idea is figure out who keystones are for a successful ecosystem. But I don't want you to always think it's top down with keystones. Like, so keystones are always top down. This one's for Steve. Where'd he go? <laughs> Steve, this one's for you. <laughs> okay, thank you, because Steve's gonna know what this fish is. What is that, Steve? If it's small enough, you may have seen it on there. It's too small to be a striper. That's right, but who does striper feed on? It's a puppy. Oh, puppy or it's, yeah, it's a Manhattan. This is a Manhattan, right? And most people don't know it, except they probably, in our society, most of us swallow it through a pill, or we drink it through a little bit of oil, because this is one of the major sources of omega-3, and it's being harvested at huge numbers out of the Chesapeake Bay. It's basically main spot, its main grounds for growing in the Chesapeake Bay, and we have basically fished it out of existence. We use it for chicken feed, we process it for omega-3 oil, but it, everybody was like, oh, well, it's low on the food chain and it reproduces really fast, so let's, we can harvest as much as we want. And we've harvested it away, enough away that it's totally changed the food dynamics. So this is osprey. In 1980s, it was 75% of the osprey diet. It is now 24%. We fished it down so much. For striped bass, Steve, you know that fish, right? I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was 77% in the 1950s. It's now down to 7% of their diet. And the same thing for weak fish and for bluefish, right? So the idea with these are, these are, who's your Manhattan, right? So who are, the, who are the pieces in your ecosystem that if you don't have those numbers, everything else falls apart as well, right? You, there are certain parts that you need to sustain the rest of the ecosystem. So it might be paying customers, straight up like that, right? It might be evangelists, external to your company. I need a lot of these because I really need the buzz going. But the question I'm asking you is who is your Manhattan? Who is your bottom thing that you must sustain because everybody else feeds off of it? If we go back to the Denali slide. Where's Denali? There. Look at how many arrows are pointing into the hair. Right? The hair is the Manhattan of the Denali system. If you lose the hairs, if there's some virus that comes in and knocks out the hair, that system is going to be in very big trouble. Right? So think about that in terms of your ecosystem that you're trying to derive. Again, I'm trying to help you think of Ways of conceptualizing your ecosystem that you're trying to, because we all like to throw around the term ecosystem. So I'm trying to drive that model a little bit farther. All right, so we did those guys. All right, so this actually ties into yesterday's talk. I love it when it comes together. First talk tied together. We're going to talk about experiments now. Planned, there's some forethought that goes into them versus natural. And you need long, for natural experiments, you need long term monitoring before. And I'm going to talk about those two types. So I'm going to actually use real data here. 
So this is OpenShift, and we're going to talk about adaptive management and planned experiments. And so what we did is we were going to send out a survey. We have a bunch of users who sign up, but then never make an application. And we're like, well, why aren't you making an application? And I'm not going to talk about the results of the direct part of the survey. What I'm going to talk about is we made an experiment out of even sending the email. Because we're an open source company, we did one email that was straight up like, we need your help, please do blah, 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 blah. But the open source part was, as part of a community that is part of a, commu a community project, we really need your feedback to help drive this project better. So one was a, just a straight up normal developer, event, developer outreach email. The other one was taking advantage of the fact that we were an open source company. And here's where I'd like to say that we did something great by doing the open source part, but the results are, we got this, these are the two numbers for the proportions of opening the email, right? So how many people opened the email? We got 0.048 for Prop A, which was the um, straight up email, and this is the one with the social appeal. And the confidence interval, you'll notice, passes through zero. It goes from minus to positive, and so what does that usually mean in statistics? That means you can't tell the difference, right? So the p-value is 0.5601. But that's science, and now I can say, well, either we need to tune our emails more, because we're not tuning them right, or that social appeal in the hosted platform as a service community means nothing, right? And so we should just give up that tact for now and not waste time trying to put those into emails. So that's a planned experiment, and that's where I'm talking about adaptive management. So I use it simply with an email here, but you could use it with a lot of things. Right, we're gonna go out and do a show. We're gonna do five shows. We're gonna hand out this type of swag at this show and this type of swag at that show. Which one gets us better signups? Which one gets us more traffic at the booth? Right, I think most of us when we do shows are just like, oh yeah, that's a cool swag, let's do it, see how it goes. And, oh, that was an okay turnout. But almost everything you do, you can actually make into a management action and do adaptive management around it. And so I think this is one of the ones where I'd like to actually have people think about more because I think a lot of us actually don't do experimentation in our everyday work. Yeah. Have you, have you written this up somewhere? No. I'll have to get approval to actually finally write it up. Um, the other thing is, when you read the slide later, I talk a little bit about type two, one and type two error. This is for the statisticians in the crowd, and I think he left. <laughs> um, but for those who are not, you need to learn about type one and type two error. Type one means saying there is a difference when there's not. And that's what we're controlling with here. Right? There is, we're pretty confident here that there is no difference. The type two is saying there is no difference when there really is. Those are two very different types of error, and they have very different implications, and you need to decide which of these two you're more concerned with. But that can just go over your head for now, and go back and read it when you, come, when you read over the slides and think about this. Okay, so my question to you is, what action can you turn into an experiment? That's right, you just have to put some forethought into it, right? That's why I put the forethought part on it. Okay, so the next one is a natural experiment. Okay, Bear, can you get this one? Where's this? <laughs> oh, I think I know this one. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. nice. So, uh, my, so this is Everglades National Park. It's another one of our very large natural parks. And the thing is, you can't really do experiments there because we have endangered species inside of it, right? And so that kind of goes against the Endangered Species Act about doing experiments. Like, you can't say, well, we'll starve to death half of our Florida panthers, and then the other half, like, or we'll change the diet on them, or we'll change the habitat for them, because they just won't allow it to happen. But that doesn't mean you can't have natural experiments. So this is Hurricane Andrew. There's the Everglades again, and that's the path of Hurricane Andrew right through the Everglades. And that's what Hurricane Andrew did to the Everglades. But, so I'm gonna do an open shift example of a natural experiment. So what a natural experiment is, you've done monitoring, and then something happens that you really either didn't plan for, or you had no control over, or you didn't make into an experiment, and then you try to draw inference after that. Right, so, as Bear knows on this one, anyone from Philadelphia, we did a bunch of shows in Philly this summer, just by happenstance. We had some guy who it was in Philly who was really excited about us, and invited us to do a whole bunch of events. So we did a whole bunch of events. So what I'm showing you here is, the light line is our sign-up numbers. Notice there's no numbers on these axes, and I've actually shifted them all so you have no idea what our sign-up potential is. <laughs> Legal likes this graph now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is our normal sign-up numbers for the United States, right? And it's shifted. This is I took it, copy, pasted it, moved it onto this one. So this is our normal numbers. So you have to be tracking the whole thing, right? I'm putting that on here. 
to show you the trend. This orange one is a city with the same population size roughly as Philadelphia. Okay? I'm not going to reveal which one. And then, because the legal doesn't like that. And then there's this <laughs> blue one, which is Philadelphia. And you can see our events in Philadelphia. Right? And the question that I tried to pose from this as an, in a natural experiment way is, do we get, if we do a bunch of really concentrated events in a city, is there a long-term boost to the arch of developer sign-up trajectory? Because right? it could be that if you really hammer a city home, you're going to see this thing, which I was hoping for, kind of go like this, and then like that. Right? Like You get some sort of snowballing effect inside the developer community. And the answer is no. Right? What you do get, you'll notice that they're these two cities are tracking about the same on population size. You get an obvious burst there, but there seems to be some sort of lingering effect for a, a couple weeks. This is a week. Every dot is a week. Sorry. Should have made that very clear. I lost the axes. Um, every yeah, dot is a week. You to <laughs> it's a week. This what? <laughs> yes. Because yeah, okay. you don't know. That, that, that's actually a million, and that's 1.5 million signing up in Philadelphia. Okay. <laughs> um, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it's more than the population. Actually, I'm doing the metro area. <laughs> I'm doing the metro area of Philadelphia, which is a, an aggregation, because the problem with doing it just for the city of Philly is that we, any event there will draw people in from New Jersey and outside of Philly itself. So this is the actual metro area, same for this one. Um, but what you can see is there seems to be a little lingering effect a couple weeks after the event, but then it just goes back to baseline again. So the answer to this natural experiment is, Concentrating in a city is not necessarily more effective except for a short period afterwards, especially if you put them together. At least for the one experiment I've done with Philadelphia versus this other city. It doesn't that have a lot to do with your activities after the event? Most events are, you know, typical Great question for the next one. So that you have to do it. We have the monitoring numbers, right? So that's why you do monitoring. And then we could look at, okay, did we follow up with emails? How often did we follow up with emails? That kind of stuff. This is just the beginning question of, now you could dive in more and like, well, maybe this was due to the fact of, yeah. but I can't answer that right now because I don't have those kinds of how much follow-up you did. All right? We usually send emails after the event to people saying, oh, hey. Well, typically marketing, especially in developer communities, they hit them for three weeks and then they leave them alone. Right. And they ignore them after that. And they, That's not they, exactly what we do, but yeah. well, we don't. I mean, some other passes in the crowd <laughs> might do something like that. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't do this on the first day. We're all leaving at noon, right? <laughs> I think I have to go after that. I got to catch uh, something after this. Um, they, I don't know what they do actually. That was a total joke. And then I also want to point out how you aggregate your data matters as well, right? So this is this is back to the first talk from yesterday, where he was teaching people to be more like scientists. I'm trying to do a little bit of that right now, right? So the point with aggregation statistics: this is monthly, and this is daily. <laughs> Same numbers, just monthly versus daily. And so with daily, I don't even see any. I would, have, I would have said there is no effect whatsoever. Event, event, same same kind of stuff, right? And if I had done monthly, I was like, oh, yeah, look at that boost. We got a huge boost across those months, right? And I don't actually think that's real. I think that's an a artifact of aggregating the data into such a large chunk. And I think this one is not aggregated enough for us to actually see things visually. So just pay attention to how you aggregate your data and play with the data. Like he said yesterday, take your data, play with it in a lot of different ways, and think about what that means for the question. Oh, so this, the takeaway is not that this is the slide you present to your boss. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. This is the one I put. Well, I don't know what, if I'm trying to get more resources, I don't know what to do with this one. Yeah, you hide that one. You hide this one also. But look at this. If I was trying to say, look how successful our events are. Right, right. Oh, man, look at the size of that spike. Right. It's huge, right? Because everything else is... You know, this is only like 100,000 down here, and then we have like the million, so. So what monitoring are you doing is the real question that comes out of that, right? Because if you're not monitoring, then you can't do natural experiments, <coughs> and you can't go back and sift through things. Okay, and then what adaptations can you make based on the, it's not just monitoring, and it's not just experimenting, it's doing those and then make adaptations to your ecosystem or in the way you're managing your ecosystem to drive it more towards the goals that you were looking for. So these are the take-homes. Be more quantitative. Do experiments, don't just do. Right? And then take advantage of natural experiments. They happen all the time for us, right? If someone calls you up and is like, oh, I really need you to do this event in Holland. 
They're like, well, we don't really do much in Holland. Well, okay, start monitoring in Holland before the event and then see what you can get out of that event. Manage your ecosystem for key indicators. This is actually the key part, before we get into a huge debate about what key indicators are, I'm gonna punt and say those all come out of your values and your goals. Right? Science doesn't answer what are the key parts unless you know your values and your goals. Diversity is important. If we went all the way back to the Denali slide, you'll notice that there's lots of connections and that if the hair population collapses, almost all the top predators can feed off of something else while the hair population recovers, because hair populations are cyclical. And then take the analogy of ecosystems farther and learn from them. So don't just say we have a developer ecosystem or we have a partner ecosystem and then not take advantage of, well, if it really is an ecosystem, how can I take that model and apply it to make better inference about what I'm doing and better management decisions? I think that's it.